English faculty lecture featuring Dr. Eduardo Fernandez. To outline my plan for this evening, the lecture will be followed by comments by a respondent, namely Dr. Judith Burling. All along, please feel free to put your questions in the chat box and I'll return to them at the end of the evening. Now, if you'd like to use closed captions, click on the closed caption square, the little square that says CC. And to make the writing bigger, click on the video button to find video settings and accessibility. Then you can adjust caption size. If you're having any trouble, just ask in the chat box and we'll try to help. So what is the Distinguished Faculty Lecture? Always a highlight of our consortial calendar. This lecture gives us the chance to honor a faculty member of the GTU faculty whose scholarship exemplifies the kind of faith-filled wisdom that we value and hope to nourish here for the sake of our religious communities and the wider society. Nominations for Distinguished Faculty Lecture come from the faculties of the member schools and the rostered faculty of the GTU who are invited to nominate one person from any GTU school except their own. The Council of Dean then reviews the nominations and makes the final selection. What this means is that the consortial faculty is choosing one person each year whose scholarship they respect enough to set forth as representative of the highest standards of this ecumenical and interreligious community of scholars. When the faculty selected this year's honoree, of course, we had no way of knowing that we'd be listening, most of us sitting alone in our homes, peering into our laptops. But if there's anyone whose warmth can emanate from a computer screen, it's this year's distinguished faculty lecturer, Dr. Eduardo Fernandez. Dr. Fernandez has asked that we begin with the benediction from Albert Douglas Honigan, a recent graduate from the master's program in biblical languages at the GTU and the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University, Dr. Fernandez's home institution. To honor the GTU's commitment to interreligious harmony, Albert will read Psalm 118 in biblical Hebrew. The next five scenes feature Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Koine Greek. And the final three scenes include Al-Fatiha in Arabic, which opens the Holy Quran. We hope that these sacred scriptures and images of our campus will unite us as a community across physical distance in peace and in prayer. Albert. Ze hayom asa Adonai, nagila venismachavo. Ana Adonai, hoshi ana, ana Adonai, hatzlihana. Eli ata veodeka, elochai aroma meka. Odul Adonai kitov, kilo olam hasto. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Bienaventurados los mansos, porque ellos recibirán la tierra por heredad. Bienaventurados los que tienen hambre y sed de justicia, porque ellos serán actos. Bienaventurados los misericordiosos, pues obterán misericordia. Bienaventurados los puros de corazón, pues verán a Dios. Heureux ceux qui procurent la paix, car ils seront appelés fils de Dieu. Heureux ceux qui sont persécutés pour la justice, car le royaume des cieux est éteint. Makari este hotan one disosin humas kai dioxesin kai eposin panponerun kathumon pzeu domino e genekin emu. Chairite kai agliaste, hoti homistos umon polus en tois oranois. Hotos gade diok santus profetas tus proumon. Bismillah rahman rahim. Alhamdulillah rab alamin. Rahman rahim. Melik yaum el din. Yakan abdu ayakan estain. 
Idna sarat al mustaqim, sarat al azina namt alayhim, wala magdub alayhim, wala al dalim. Amin. Thank you, Albert. Now to introduce Dr. Fernandez, it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to my colleague, Dr. Catherine Barouche, who is Thomas E. Bertelson, Jr., Associate Professor of Art and Religion at the GTU and JST. Dr. Barouche is an art historian who connects art and experience. She became rather famous recently for her exploration of a labyrinth in the GTU series on spiritual care and ethical leadership, which you can find on our website. Dr. Barouche's current project is her book, Imaging Pilgrimage, Art as Embodied Experience. Dr. Barouche. Thank you, Dr. Pena. Good evening, everyone. I wanna start off with a little story. In late August, 2020, after what felt like quite a long summer, the faculty of the Jesuit School of Theology settled into a virtual faculty retreat. Like many gatherings in this time of pandemic, it happened on Zoom. We waited while the Brady Bunch boxes were populated with familiar faces. We had all been sheltering in place and no one had had haircuts in months. In one of the squares appeared a man with wild white hair and glasses. Is that Albert Einstein? Asked one of my colleagues. We all squinted at the box and it was in fact Eduardo Fernandez and not the ghost of Albert Einstein. Professor Eduardo C. Fernandez and Albert Einstein have more in common than one might think. It is true that one of them is a Latino theologian from El Paso, Texas, and the other is a German Jewish physicist born in 1879, but both attended Catholic schools. Both have an appreciation for art and experiential learning, and both have a passion for pedagogy and for thinking outside the box. I found some quotes attributed to Einstein that I can easily imagine Eddie saying. It is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. The only source of knowledge is experience. And I wanna share a few more quotes. At a time when there is so much which divides us, art can make us whole, Eduardo Fernandez. Divisions start to give way as we experience the divine spark in each Eduardo Fernandez. One powerful image or a film clip engaged by open hearts a photograph revealing a person's dignity or nature's rich textures, not to mention musical treasures from worldwide faith communities or the silence between notes can do more to teach contemplation than a million disconnected words, Eduardo Fernandez. Each autumn since 1976, the GTU faculty has honored a distinguished professor. The criteria is that the person embodies the scholarly standards, teaching excellence, and commitment to ecumenism that, that defined the Graduate Theological Union. Nominations are made by GTU faculty and are considered by the Council of Deans, which selects the lecturer. Tonight, we honor Eddie Fernandez, SJ, Professor of Pastoral Theology and Ministry at the Jesuit School of Theology and Santa Clara University and the Graduate Theological Union. Eddie received his BA, Loyal University of the South, his MA from the University of Texas at Austin, Department of Latin American Studies. He is also an alum of the GTU, earning his MDiv from the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley. His doctoral degree in missiology is from the Gregorian Pontifical University in Rome. Eddie is passionate about teaching. His classrooms engage the senses. One October, I invited him to a class I was teaching on composing sacred spaces, where he agreed to teach a session on Dia de los Muertos in his own Mexican Catholic tradition. I watched as he transformed the classroom into a space of celebration with textiles and copal, ofrenda, and flowers. 
He taught me the word for these immersive and celebratory experiences, flor y canto, flowers and song, and that the world can always use more of this. Some of Father Fernandez's flagship courses include Sacraments in Latino Context, Latinx Religion, Religious Expressions, and Spirituality and Art. In addition to an amazing 27 years of teaching at the GTU, he has also served as president of the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the United States, ACHTUS, who in 2011 awarded him the Virgilio Elizondo Award for Distinguished Achievement in Theology in keeping with the mission of the Academy. Eddie is a frequent collaborator with the Wabash Center and has served on leadership teams, training pre-tenure faculty and participating in special dialogues around the role of race and ethnicity in the academy. He has a robust publishing career and is the author of a number of books. These include La Cosecha, Harvesting Contemporary US Hispanic Theology from Collegeville Michael Glazer, which has second and third editions in Mexico and Chile, La Vida Sacra, Contemporary Hispanic Sacramental Theology from Roman and Littlefield in 2006 with James Emperor, and Mexican American Catholics from Paulist Press 2007, winner of the 2008 Catholic Press Association Award. His most recent book, co-edited with Deborah Ross at the Jesuit School of Theology, is called Doing Theology as if People Mattered, Encounters in Contextual Theology. It comprises a number of essays by GTU and JST faculty. Together, they narrate a reflexive account of the doing of contextual theology. It explores practicing contextual theology in the classroom and beyond in service and in international immersions, interreligious dialogue and mission. The cover is an image by John August, artist John August Swanson, and it engenders the content of the book in so many ways. Two processions of people meet. Their ages, races, and genders are ambiguous. They represent the global community. As they walk together, each holds a candle of illumination. Swanson says of the image that he was inspired by the Festival of Lights, where children would gather from many places, joining in an unending procession towards peace and nonviolence. As Eddie and Deborah state in their introduction, the ancient term mystagogy references moving deeper into the mysteries of faith. And we have moved deeper, they write, in a mystagogical sense into what the memory and practice of contextual theology really means. This evening's presentation is a reflection on what we have strived for and will continue to strive for as a community of theologians, of students, of teachers, of artists, of activists, of people who are laboring for a more just world. Tonight's lecture aims to remind us of the importance of looking back, taking in the big picture, and counting our blessings as together we a new tomorrow. Without further ado, it is my greatest pleasure to present Eduardo Fernandez on the topic of Hacienda Memoria, revisiting our blessings at GTU. Good evening, everyone. I'm honored that you are joining us electronically. Naturally, when I first found out that I had been selected to give this lecture, I felt somewhat intimidated. Knowing the distinguished caliber of professors in the past who were invited to do the same. Yet, as the saying goes, one quoted last Saturday evening by our new vice president elect, Kamala Harris, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And this standing has humbled me while also inspiring me to share some thoughts with you that I have been musing in my heart. I want to begin with gratitude, a spiritual practice often underestimated. Gratitude for you, my dear audience members, among whom can be found my supportive family, friends, and parishioners. In a special way, I want to express my gratitude to those of you who are zooming in from my hometown, El Paso, Texas. Today, we made the cover of the New York Times, but it wasn't good news. In fact, it was sad news 
about the rapid spread of the COVID, COVID virus and the need for field hospitals. My sisters and brothers on the border in Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, our thoughts, prayers go out to you. I hope you take courage from what I will say tonight, the courage I got from you. I also want to uh, express my gratitude for our veterans who have served our country. We salute you on this momentous Veterans Day and always. Gratitude for you, the faculty and deans of, graduate the of the Graduate Theological Union who have invited me to speak tonight. To you, my esteemed colleagues, both at my school, the Jesuit School of Theology and the wider GTU Consortium. I want to express my gratitude to my colleague, Dr. Kate Barouche for introducing me. Very rarely am I compared to Einstein. Thank you, Kate. To Dr. Judith Burling, former GTU Dean, who has prepared the response to follow. To Mr. Albert Douglas Honigan, one of our recent graduates, whose opening benediction has situated us in the sacred place we call home. And to Dr. Elizabeth Pena and her team for their diligent work behind the scenes, especially Dr. Deandra Erickson, Director of Digital Learning. Thank you. Muchas gracias. If you take nothing away from my words tonight, know that I appreciate what you have given me as a member of this interreligious and international community, and I am forever indebted to you. I have entitled tonight's lecture, Haciendo Memoria, revisiting our blessings at the GTU, because I would like to revisit our past. Haciendo Memoria, which in Spanish literally translates as doing memory, goes beyond making a simple list of past events toward a deeper, richer contemplation of how we have been blessed to be connected with the vision that inspired those who went before us here. Those who dare to dream that seekers, Hindus, Buddhists, Jewish people, Christian, Muslims, Muslims and people of goodwill who profess no religious affiliation could all study under one blessed canopy, respectfully listening to each other's experience of the sacred, while at the same time working towards renewing the face of the planet, our common home, especially significant now given our current climate crisis racial tensions, and pandemic. I hope that tonight's Haciendo Memoria will allow us to celebrate our deep history and legacy of blessings, while also allowing us to inquire about where we stand today and where we wish to go tomorrow. First, I will briefly describe what might be called a theology of haciendo memoria. Then I will wax nostalgic down Graduate Theological Union memory lane, sharing some cherished memories of our community's past and present. And finally, we conclude our time travel together with reflections on our diversity, unity, and commitment to service as blessings of our legacy, as well as spaces for growth that now invite us to form a stronger, even more blessed future together. As anyone who has ever taken a class with me can attest, I, like my father, love stories. I love their deep texture 
how they draw us in, how they engage a methodology that is more inductive than deductive, their appeal to metaphor and to mystery, all especially appropriate as we, as we here on Holy Hill do theology. Or as the Dominican Gustavo Gutierrez reminds us, God talk. As he puts it, talk about God, theology, comes from the silence of prayer and commitment. Stories by their very nature do not come out of a vacuum. Quite the contrary. They are connected with communities and have a way of bringing people and communities together. For one story elicits another. Take, for example, the visual story in this image painted by El Paso artist Magda Garcia and her nephew, Alex Rodriguez. Magda designed this work for the 100th anniversary celebration of Sacred Heart Church in El Paso, which is only two blocks from the U.S.-Mexico border, titling it Año del Barrio, Year of the Neighborhood. As she told me the story of its composition, especially how they sought to bring heaven and earth together into one person reaching out to us, I marveled at how, if they say a picture is worth a thousand words, art can convey what mere words cannot. I love this image, not just because it is the cover of my first book, but also because it represents a coming together of two very different worlds in a concrete embodied community wrapped in light despite the darkness of forces which threaten to divide it. I wouldn't be surprised if, for example, during this pandemic, we all find ourselves more reflective, trying to take in both the day-to-day -day details we can no longer take for granted, and also surveying, lovingly, I hope, the big picture. As Alex Garcia Rivera, a GTU professor of happy memory would say, the little stories which make up part of the big story. Today, we speak of the need to do theology contextually, in context. What exactly does that mean? This is where tradition, or looking back so as to understand where we have been, where we are, and where we might be going, is indispensable. With this in mind, I propose that we engage stories tonight to do this type of contextual theology, one which privileges thick, provocative, high context, metaphorical description, which is quite circular in logic, as opposed to more abstract, analytical, linear thinking, which is more deductive than inductive. Hacer memoria means that you work hard at remembering, and not just remembering mentally, but as Uruguayan historian Eduardo Galeano reminds us in Spanish, to recordar, to remember, by remembering through the heart. Recalling both the good times and the bad. Through the heart. Not exactly the stuff of cute valentines or emojis. Wholeheartedly. Through the heart. Through the heart means that we should not put aside passionate feelings and holy desires as we reflect theologically 
on this centuries-old walk of faith, a faith which sustained our ancestors as unreconcilable as, as it might seem sometimes, unrecognizable as it might seem sometimes. The African-American theologian, Dwight N. Hopkins, who identifies the black theology of liberation in Toni Morrison's novels, filled with examples of poor black women's spirituality, writes the following in his book, Shoes That Fit Our Feet. Like a natural spring in the rich soil of the Black Belt South, theology in African-American folk culture gushes forth in all directions. Waters of self-identity and self-affirmation spew out and blanket the black earth. Poetry, plays, work songs, folk tales, blues, short stories, autobiographies, sermons, toasts, ballads, personal narratives and protest literature blossom. Here, showered with the wealth of colorful, distinctive material, a poor people name and claim themselves with the flowers of new definitions and positive assertions. I now will share a little bit about what I took away from these past months of revisiting what happens here at the GTU, why we do what we do, and more so, why it is that we can do what we do. And where did my heart, mi corazoncito go when I tried to make memory? Our campuses with their classrooms, open spaces, libraries and places of worship soon flooded my imagination. I had plenty to recall given my 27 year long and counting affiliation with this place we call home. Three years at JSTB as an MDiv student and now in my 24th year as faculty. This past year, our own Jesuit School of Theology marked its 50th anniversary of accepting the invitation to join this unique consortium. Having moved from a rural, more monastic setting to this urban center, two blocks from one of the most prestigious universities in the world, the University of California at Berkeley, we were blessed in 2009 to become part of Santa Clara University, a partnership which has created great new possibilities. Every now and then, especially when I am officiating in some capacity as a Roman Catholic priest and theologian, someone expresses surprise that I teach in Berkeley. Berkeley? Berserkly? That radical place? You Jesuits really have a school of theology there? But as our founder, Ignatius of Loyola, gradually discovered, an important spiritual work is to find God in all things and all things in God. Schools and universities often, be, often being unique places for this quest. Indeed, with its diversity of religious traditions, what better place to engage in this blessed pursuit than here at the GTU? On November 16, 1989, Soon after the ruthless assassination, 
soon after the ruthless assassination of six Jesuit brothers and Elba the cook and Selena, her 16-year-old daughter, at the University of Central America in El Salvador, the great Robert McAfee Brown, who taught here at the Pacific School of Religion and had served as a Protestant observer at, at Vatican II, spoke words of consolation and challenge. He said these at an evening prayer we had at one of the Jesuit residences. Joined by our other GTU friends during a time when we felt so powerless, not to mention complicit, as we knew the U.S. government was supporting the army that carried out this atrocity and many others as we were learning from Salvadoran refugees. At the same time, we were able to feel consolados, consoled, comforted, strengthened, empowered to continue to fight this good fight. We didn't feel alone that night because in our pain, we were being held in the arms of our loving, compassionate, interfaith and prophetic GTU community. This year's anniversary, just a few days away, will be particularly poignant as recently, after 31 years, a Spanish court finally convicted the perpetrators of this heinous crime, sending a clear gl global message in defense of human rights and social justice. An important part of my preparation for this lecture came about serendipitously. When you start having multiple copies of the same book on your shelves, you realize that it is time to clean out your office. Okay, I haven't exactly done that, but by the grace of God, I have made some progress during this pandemic in going through hard copies of theses and dissertations in which I served as either director or reader, I pondered these memories of our shared work in my heart. As I looked at the spreadsheet of theses and dissertations, I discovered close to 150 works which covered a wide variety of topic by students from 34 countries. 34 countries every continent except Antarctica. How was this possible? As students from different countries began to discover their own voice and become more cognizant that the communities from, from which they came were already in their own way doing theology, they helped us to assemble a savvy dissertation committee, among these, a significant number of international scholars, each of us bringing our own passion and expertise to this project. It quickly became clear to me that if I were to direct or be part of a dissertation committee, I could only do so by learning from this type of interdisciplinary and at times interreligious wisdom. Some of these dissertations later creatively morphed into books. The composition of our student body also brought its surprises. While as a Latino theologian before coming here to teach, I imagined that most of the projects in which I would participate would either be about Latinx persons in the United States or Latin Americans, I was amazed to discover that a far greater number 
actually have been, have been related to Asian and African countries. This international diversity still amazes me because as a junior scholar here at the GTU, I was blessed with excellent mentors who showed me the power of intercultural interdisciplinarity. Among them, for example, has been our dear Judith Burling, an expert on Chinese and comparative religions who gently recruited me to our interdisciplinary studies doctoral area at a local Japanese restaurant. Having read my CV more carefully than I had composed it. As well, someone who mentored me with much love was Bill O'Neill, an ethicist who had spent part of his youth teaching in, in Tanzania and is now working with refugees in Kenya. As my spiritual advisor, Bill reminded me again and again that no matter what happened, God would bless me. Our monthly faculty colloquia at the Jesuit school similarly provided me with a safe space to develop as a scholar, teacher, and practitioner. A colleague there, Mia Mochizuki, an art historian, helped me to realize that I was actually already engaging the arts to teach my course. This course was Latino religious expressions. I cherish this photo with Mia and Professor Emeritus, Dr. John Andres. Mia and I are still in touch with several of the students who took our art and enculturation class. And if, if you notice the picture on the screen, uh, this is when one of our students, uh, Dr. Suchi Lin from Taiwan, this was the celebration after she had defended her dissertation. So there is Dr. Lin, and behind her is Dr. An Tran. You might notice Dr. Kate Barouche, a little bit to the right with the longer hair, and yours truly sitting there uh, close to the front of the table. I hope you don't notice that there's a wine bottle in front of me. But you might notice, and this is a little bit of, of a joke during the pandemic, that it seems that Dr. An Tran's hair has gotten a lot longer, and Dr. Kate Barouche's hair has gotten a lot shorter. We were delighted to see that Dr. Lin just published her first book based on the dissertation she did with us. All throughout this time and work, Dr. Arthur Holder's input and colleagueship have remained a constant grace. Having served the GTU as Dean and Vice President of Academic Affairs for 14 years of distinguished service, he is still going strong. Having officially stepped down as Dean, but still keeping the dream alive by generously continuing to work with us, faculty and students. Despite the very challenging times in which we find ourselves, survivors remind us of the importance of looking back, taking in the big picture and counting our blessings as together we envision a new tomorrow. Even though, to be honest, I do not always feel it in my heart of hearts, I am convinced that as our faith traditions will affirm, despite the seemingly chaotic times in which we find ourselves, we must not lose sight of significant dawning opportunities before us. 
After all, it's always darkest before dawn. These are not only times for savoring the values of diversity, unity, and service, but now is also a time for continuing to work tirelessly to make them a reality. Haciendo memoria and envisioning tomorrow in this way honors the religious traditions of our ancestors, this cloud of witnesses, some of whom sing today, We've walked this far by faith. By immersing ourselves in the sacred texts, spiritual practices, and liberative movements of our communities, we open ourselves to conversion. Not in the sense of trying to convince ourselves that others are wrong and we are right, but in the Lonergonian notion of conversion as the expansion of horizons, deeper engagement, more inclusive encounters. Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, the founders of the United Farm Workers in the 1960s here in California, epitomized this can-do notion in Justice's famous battle cry, Si sí se puede, si sí se puede, or as President Barack Obama adapted it, yes, we can, yes, we can. Isn't this what we are hearing from our hardworking dreamers, undocumented youth who already are serving this great country? A daughter of Mexican immigrants who teaches second, second grade recently asked her mother how she was able to survive the hardships associated with coming to this country at a young age. Her mother's answer went right to the point. Because our dreams for our children were greater than our fears. We are who we are because of our ancestors' sacrifice. I would like to bring to conclusion my presentation by showing how the three values named above, diversity, unity, and service, can continue to not only be blessings for us here at the GTU community and other theological centers, but also pose challenges for a new era. First, diversity. A review of these 150 or so theses and dissertations in which I was blessed to participate, demonstrate an embrace of this ideal. At the GTU, diversity itself assumes a panoply of forms, for example, doing contextual theology from international perspectives engaging interdisciplinarity, interculturality, interreligious dialogue, and now interreligious theology, which maintains that people of other faith can help deepen our own. Diversity at the GTU has broadened our horizons beyond our wildest imagination. At the same time, we must not just pat ourselves on the back and rest on our laurels. A good question for all of us here at the GTU to contemplate as we prepare our students to teach and minister in the not too distant future is, to what extent does our faculty or even our student bodies rep rep reflect the diversity found in our faith communities. The ticket for president and vice president that is perhaps the most diverse to run for the offices has just received the most votes of any ticket in U.S. history. 
the oldest person to occupy the office of president and the first woman, first black woman, first woman of South Asian descent, and first woman of immigrant parents have just been elected our president and vice president. Despite the challenges of 2020, let us give thanks and celebrate the fact that there indeed has never been a better time than now to unite and embrace our diversity. Second, unity. So many of us have been horrified to witness the lack of unity in our countries as serious chasms fomented by political, economic, racial, ethnic, and religious divisions boil at the surface. In our country, the so-called culture wars continue to haunt us as we find ourselves often not being able to speak to family or friends who beg to differ from our own stances on these life issues. A real grace for me being here at the GTU is to struggle with trying to remain open to the faith conviction of others, especially if I have not first made the effort to get to know what those convictions are from their words, not simply from what people say about them. Considering the attention we give to studying scripture texts, imagine, for example, what a Christian student can learn from a Jewish professor about the Psalms, which Jesus himself, a Jew, fervently prayed at the core of our name, the Graduate Theological Union, we unite. The arts, similarly, can continue to work their magic in bringing us together as we simply open ourselves to a renewed conversion experience. as I wrote recently for our GTU Center for the Arts and Religion website. Among the greatest contributions the GTU can continue to make to world communities is a deep appreciation of the ecumenical and interreligious as it relates to lived religion, whether that of today or centuries past. Material culture communicates in surprising ways how religion and spirituality cannot be understood if not communicated through the senses, a type of bridge from the concrete to the abstract. As the divine is often experienced through beauty, St. Augustine's, O oh, ancient beauty, late have I loved you, the long tradition of the arts at our consortium have taught us that by experiencing and appreciating each other's art forms blended together harmoniously, whether through the spoken word, visual art, music, dance, architecture, crafts or cuisine, we allow ourselves to be invited into the sacred in an embodied holistic way. Divisions start to give way as we experience the divine spark in each of us. I experienced this holiness when, thanks to our professor of Islamic studies, Dr. Munir Jiwa, I reflected on his explanation of the Muslim artist Salma Arastu's work being displayed in our library and found myself writing about it for a sacred scripture reflection blog the very next day. 
finally, the third and final vision, service. The word which most often comes to mind when I think of my past and present students is scholar practitioner. Many come to us with vast experience of having worked in ministerial settings, teaching, doing advocacy work, social workers, medical professionals, etc. Realizing that they needed not only to renew and grow academically, but also to bring these fonts of communal wisdom to theological forms. At the same time, these women and men remind me again and again that in our scholarship and teaching, we have to be accountable not only to our professional academic guild, but also to the communities from where these theologies are emerging. Several of our indigenous scholars over the years, for example, have challenged the notion that the Western way of thinking, heavy on the rational, is the only way to think. Hence my stress on the Spanish hacer memoria, doing memory, and recordar or remembering with its nuances refer referring to heart, beauty, and community, so as to remember keeping someone or something in mind, which of course ultimately engages our heart. But we should not limit this embodiment of service to professors and students. Our staff persons and administrators are angels in human form. As Brother Manny in, in our El Paso Jesuit community once remarked, my job, like a good mechanic, is to keep the planes flying. I love walking over to the registrar with a student who has just defended her or his thesis or dissertation, for instance, to see the joy of the administrators and staff as they personally congratulate those who have demonstrated by their hard work that si se puede, yes we can. Not being a good fundraiser myself, I equally have great respect for those who beg on our behalf helping donors practice good stewardship with the blessings they have received. Could it be then that we can do what we do because as the previously quoted immigrant mother commented, because our dreams for a better world are greater than our fears, whether through feeding the poor at People's Park on a Sunday morning, encountering the homeless face to face and discovering that they have much to teach us as we advocate for affordable housing, serving as chaplains in prisons, hospitals, congregations, shelters for migrants and refugees and university centers and campuses, in designing programs to teach religious literacy in community colleges. Ours is a holy work, one which draws from the best of our religious tradition, blessed by the harvest inherited from those who went before us. Let us continue to unite in our diversity and serve others as we learn together. After all, in the words of Rumi, the 13th century mystic poet. We are all just walking each other home. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Well, thank you so much, Eddie. Um, I know I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one here who feels like that was just 
the right talk at the right time. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful to have been part of it, to be able to hear you. Now I'd like to introduce our respondent for tonight, although she was actually already introduced by Eddie. 20 years ago, Judith Burling was the distinguished faculty lecturer. So it's wonderful to welcome her back tonight as respondent. Dr. Burling is the professor, is Professor Emerita of Chinese and Comparative Religions at the GTU. She served as Dean from 1987 to 1996 and was called into later service as Acting Dean in 2007-2008, and then again as Interim Dean in fall 2016. Not only is Dr. Burling a scholar of Chinese spirituality and religious thought, but she's an authority in interreligious learning and theological education. In the years following her distinguished faculty lecture, Dr. Burling received the inaugural Sarlo Excellence in Teaching Award, published an influential book entitled Understanding Other Religious Worlds, A Guide for Interreligious Education, engaged in the, in the Interreligious Education and Pedagogy Project, and was the subject of a symposium, Learning as Collaborative Conversation, celebrating the scholarship and teaching of Judith Burling. So without further ado, Judith Burling. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm honored and delighted to be the respondent for Professor Fernandez's distinguished faculty lecture. In particular, since he chose to focus on doing memory about the GTU. It's a truism of our times that theological education and religious institutions in general are under enormous strain in this rapidly changing world. It is all too easy to fall into gloom about our futures. But Professor Fernandez has reminded us this evening that doing memory is an important practice in renewing our commitment to values that define our very reason for being. I'm deeply grateful to him for doing so. Doing memory, as Professor Fernandez reminded us, is about honoring our ancestors, our forebears, and honoring the traditions out of which we do our contextual theologies and set our mission and goals as a community. The GTU certainly had visionary and inspired forebears. One of the many memorable quotes about it in its early days was, it's based on mutual commitments to a vision and held together by faith. It shouldn't work, but it does. But while tonight's lecture took us down memory lane, it also recognized that the original vision and tradition have evolved as the world and our community have evolved. Originally about ecumenism, particularly between Catholics and Protestants, over the years it has become increasingly interreligious, concerned about sustaining our planet, focused on contextual theologies, both global and domestic, committed to preparing students for new alternative forms of ministry and justice work, and engaged with the complex hybrid intersectional identities across cultures, religions, nations, and genders. As scholars of religion and theology, we know very well that traditions hold important important foundational truths and principles, but they also evolve among living communities of adherence in many environments and situations. The lecture lifted up three core values or blessings of the GTU that we need to carry into our future. First, diversity. Over the years, the diversity of the GTU has continued to grow from a relatively tame difference of Christian denominations to become ever more diverse religiously, ethnically, culturally, as Eddie said, beyond the range of our wildest imaginations. Allow me to share a memory of Eddie and I engaging with cultural diversity that we never had imagined. We served together on the dissertation committee of a gifted indigenous theologian from the Andean Highlands, a, a Quechua speaker, he invited the two of us to a post-defense party in a crowd of his relatives and Peruvian indigenous friends. At one point in the evening, 
He asked us to perform a culturally appropriate ceremony to mark the occasion. All of a sudden, Eddie and I found ourselves pouring an entire bottle of red wine very slowly onto an open dissertation and then dancing together to lead off the group's celebratory dance. Sometimes celebrations of diversity is not just an abstract principle, but an embodied practice that pulls us out of our limited cultural norms. Professor Fernandez is correct to challenge us to reflect whether in our faculty and student body, we reflect the full diversities of the communities we serve. But I wanna add that this commitment to diversity challenges and commits all of us, most especially faculty, but also students who study here to continually learn from and with each other. I recall a moment in one of my classes when a very conservative Muslim legal scholar was stunned when a black progressive Baptist feminist made a comment that perfectly captured, illumined and affirmed the core of his work. She had listened to him very carefully to cut through to the very heart of his work as he himself saw it. And he, steeped in the traditional training of the Islamic sciences, learned that a non-Muslim woman and a woman from a very different cultural setting could nonetheless give him insight about his own work. They taught one another in and through their very real differences, and each came to understand more profoundly their place in a diverse human community. The entire class, including me, were enriched by their model of learning across difference. Second, unity. In our highly polarized world, we have begun to doubt the possibility of unity. And we suspect that some, it sometimes erases important differences and realities. And so it can. As in all institutions, we at GTU continually struggle to rid ourselves of racist, patriarchal, exclusivist, and Christian triumphalist biases. But the ideal of unity at the GTU has never been about sameness. As I used to say, our schools and centers don't agree on anything except that we are in Berkeley. Now we would have to say the Bay Area. And we don't agree on whether that is a strength or a liability. Our unity comes not from erasing difference, but from undertaking an act of faith that genuinely engaging with others across lines of difference can yield insights, wisdom, friendship, alliances, and new possibilities. And we have discovered that it is often most promising to do this through the arts, which open our hearts and imaginations to new ways of seeing and to new stories. A world rent by division can learn much from our practices of unity and difference. Third, service. I'm particularly grateful that this lecture linked the value of service as core to the GTU. As one who came to the GTU in theological education from the world of religious studies, in an era when religious studies was bending itself into knots to be objective about religion, to study religion for its own sake, I have been deeply inspired by the fact that the scholarship we foster in this community is about issues that can make a difference in and to the world. We marry academic rigor with a commitment to issues that matter, ideas that matter, and the inspiring work of our scholar practitioner graduates testifies to that tradition. Some of you may know that the late great Robert Bella, with a heavy load of advisees at Cal, happily joined many GTU doctoral committees precisely because our students were working on issues that matter. The values we represent and strive for are needed more than ever in today's world. May we listen to Professor Fernandez remembering to do memory in order to maintain our aspirations and commitment to these ideals, to continue what he called our holy work. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, now I'll turn to some questions from the chat box. If anyone wants to write some questions in there, I'll just read a comment um, that came in from um, Victor Setibo. Um, Eddie it says, thank you so much, Eddie, for this brilliant presentation. It has helped some of us to remember and appreciate what we have gained from being part of the GTU community. Thank you so much for your commitment. What you do has an impact in the world because you have taught uh, students from all over the world. Congratulations for this nom nomination. Be blessed abundantly. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Eddie, I don't know if you want to make some comments in response to um, what you just said. Oh, it's very rare that I'm speechless. <laughs> but I, I don't know, it's just a wonderful feeling of uh, that what I said reflects so much of uh, to have someone like Judith with her experience and kind of knowing it uh, as a dean with all its challenges, you know, uh, such as financial challenges and other challenges. And, but to see her so hopeful and challenging, like, yes, we can, for me, that it's, it's just very encouraging. It, 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 and, and the way she ended with this is holy work, we all need to remind each other of that because sometimes we just have our, our tired backs and shoulders and we, we think we've been at this forever and it doesn't matter. And then you have comments like Victor's there and, and other people who are posting. And so it, it, for me, it, this, this has been an incredible exercise. I'm very touched. Um, let me read uh, another comment that just came in. Uh, this is from Devin Zuber. He says, thanks for these beautiful reflections and insightful observations, Eddie and Judith. At a moment when we are all so keenly feeling the absence of community, this fed my soul for, re for reminding me of the dear people, places, and conversations that make the GTU such a vibrant, unique intellectual home beautiful and heartwarming to be reminded of this after being deprived of it for almost two semesters and counting. Never again will I take it for granted. Mm. Question, art can convey things in ways that words cannot. Can you share some thoughts on how art or the arts might help further heal the current divides, the enormous divisions in our American society? What can the arts do that the words of theology cannot? I, I think one of the beauties of art is that you, you know, and, and it took me a while to kind of understand this, but we often think of art in kind of a didactic way that, you know, you, you have the idea and art illustrates it. But there's, there's a wonderful story, Martha Graham, I think, the story about how uh, she, she did this dance and then they asked her, what does the dance mean? And she said something like, Honey, if I had to explain it to you, I wouldn't have to dance it. So I think the arts bring us into the mystery. So right away, you know that, okay, I'm not gonna just, I, I'm, I'm in the mystery. I, and then you kind of have to get over yourself. It's like somebody trying to learn to dance and they keep looking at their feet. They're not gonna learn to dance. So you have to relax, get into the music. And artists, I'm thinking especially of uh, just, um, like I spent many years in New Orleans and it is such a, such a gumbo of rich culture. Think about food, for example. So cuisine and dance and, and then you think about Latin America. So much of my work has been uh, reflecting on Latin America. And again, all these incredible blend, blends from Africa and indigenous traditions and um, the uh, Iberia. So it's, for me, I think, I think what it makes us do it is if you take things apart, and the best example I have here for you, again, this is a dance example, to, just to show you how important dance is. Uh, this, this comes from uh, Rosa Guerrero, who, who uh, may very well be watching. Uh, she texted me today, but one of the things she taught, she, do, she did was she, she danced a dance, El Jarabe Tapatio, which is a very typical Mexican dance from Guadalajara. 
And everybody will say, that is so Mexican. That is just Mexican. And then Rosa, who taught in the public schools for the longest time, just takes the dance apart. Shows you, okay, look at this. This comes from here. This comes from there. This comes from there. And that's why it's a harabe. It's a mixture. But the, the, and, then, and then that whole sense of the, I think so much of our attention comes out of our own insecurities. I think that the arts make us, help us, invite us to do our own story, our own historical stories. And, and, and to kind of like realize, okay, okay, we all have, you know, we all have things that are very sad from our past. That's why I think of Dolly Parton, for example, her, her songs are so good because she sings from where she comes from. When you think about those, or Linda Rodstam, or, or again, singers, uh, dancers, cooks, you know, they, they have a wonderful way of bringing together in a way that kind of catches you off guard. And then all of a sudden you're saying, why is this moving me so much? Uh, but that's what artists do for us. Thank you. Um, here's one more question for you, Eddie. Um, let's see, oop, it just disappeared. Okay, how, this is from Pamela Stevens. Uh, how did working on mm -hmm. La Vida Sacra affect your perspective of multi-faith, interfaith, contextualized faith practices at the GTU? Wow. <laughs> You can tell she's a doctoral student, right? <laughs> uh, I think it really helped. Um, you know, one of the things, again, somebody told me right when I was starting my career, uh, hitch, yourself, hitch yourself to a rising star. And, uh, and a person who taught me so, so much and that we wrote Vida Sacra together, James Emperor, Jake Emperor, who uh, taught here liturgy for many years. Uh, Jake was always telling us, pay attention. You know, the, the phenomenological way, and it's always, but usually by the end of the semester, I've learned to say the word, but basically it means open your eyes and pay attention. Don't assume that you know anything. So he would tell us that good liturgists should spend lots of times in the pews and, and, and watch. So I think that there was a method that Jake kind of worked with working here that then when he went to San Fernando Cathedral, so you picture this predominantly Mexican-American church and how um, he had to ask the Guadalupanas on Saturday morning at their breakfast tacos about some of the questions that came up from our research because he just couldn't assume that because there was an article, because somebody said it. So it's this wonderful sense about uh, stay open. Everybody can teach you. And I think Vida Sacra, uh, and now I, I love that uh, every year, uh, Dr. Mayers, Dr. Ruth Mayers, a liturgist, they use our book at the Episcopalian school. And they invite me to come and, and have a conversation with them. And every time I come, and I'm going to go next week, so, so no, don't worry, Ruth, I haven't written you back, but I'm going, I'm going. But it's that sense about, you know, uh, I learned so much. I learned so much. And it's, it's really touching to see the affirmation. Because that's another thing is often those of us who have been minoritized, we don't believe in what we have. One of the saddest example for me, and you all can appreciate this because we're living in a different world. But I remember as a kid growing up on the border, there was a little boy who would cross every day and uh, would come to our school, Mount Carmel School. And he would bring these delicious burritos. Manuel was his name. His mother had made them that morning. The tortillas were fresh, the frijoles were fresh, chile. But he was embarrassed to eat the burrito in front of the rest of us. So he would put the burrito in a paper bag and eat it. Because if you had bologna and white bread, that was nice. But a real burrito, although now they're wraps, right? <laughs> but again, you see my point. And you know, I just think it's exciting that in his latest encyclical, Pope Francis is saying, ah, 
why do we disregard who we are, where we come from, and quickly think that somebody else, especially the more affluent countries, that we have to be like them? Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if that's okay with you, Eddie. Sure, of course. Okay, um, this is from April Renee Lynch, mm -hmm. who asks, does doing memory ever distract, ever pull away from us being vessels for filling up and distributing largesse, however a person may interpret this? St. John of the Cross? Hmm. Well, even, even to, uh, to read John of the Cross or to, to know the memory of St. John of the Cross and what was going on and his own search and this nada, 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 this nothingness, I mean, that's, that's memory. And good memory, it's, 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 like, um, it's like writing this talk. I've never spent more hours on writing a talk than this talk. Uh, more, I mean, more words have ended up on the cutting room floor of my office than anything I've ever done. And why? Because it required all those memories. It required the pruning. It required the letting go, as we all know when we write or when we have a talk to give. But it also was the memory of, okay, so to write this talk, I have to remember you all. And I have to remember who my students have been. And I have to remember who my mentors have been. And I have to remember the homeless down at People's Park. So I think there's, yes, there's memory and there's a time to fill up and there's a time to empty. And that's, that's what I hope, that's what this has been for me. Thank you. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I think I'll end the evening by reading um, a comment by another one of our uh, um, participants here, Jan uh, Robisher. And she says, thank you so much, Eddie, and kudos for your wonderful and insightful presentation. We need everything, the arts in all forms, food and rituals, theology, and the practice of diversity, unity, and service are just the antidote we need for the divisiveness and meanness in our world. So thank you, Eddie, for bringing, bringing us some of that and nourishing us tonight. And thank congratulations. You. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all, thank you. I'm, I'm so honored. I'm, believe it or not, I'm speechless. <laughs> I feel like the cowardly lion, but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Congratulations, Eddie. It was a wonderful evening with you and thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you all. And, and Judith, again, thank you for your response and Kate for your presentation. All of you, all of you, thank you so much. Blessings on you and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you.